Welcome into the latest edition of the Cubs Recap Podcast, the presentation of our Recap channel on YouTube. That's R-E-K-A-P, as well as available audio only everywhere you get your favorite podcasts. Wait a minute. Is it everywhere? Is it on Spotify? Yes. We had a, we had a listener call us on that one. They have it. Uh, Spotify has it. Apple, all the places. Okay. Uh, Buzzsprout, yes. And my partner, Gordon Wittenmeyer, I'm David Kaplan. We'll have a special guest, Dan Evans, the former general manager of the Dodgers front office man with White Sox, Cubs, Mariners, and Blue Jays, I believe, and a dear friend of mine and who a guy who has done a ton of scouting in Japan and is very familiar with the Cubs' biggest signee to date. It's their only one. Shota. <laughs> Imanaga, the left-handed starter, has agreed to terms. He has to pass the physical on Thursday, and then he'll be at Cubs convention on Friday over at the Sheraton. So the Cubs finally open up that, whew, get those moths off there. The checkbook has come out of the drawer. Gordon, your thoughts on what the Cubs did? Well, I mean, I'm sure that's what distracted Michael Penix Jr. the other night when the Cubs started getting active and it caught everybody off guard after doing nothing all winter. Um, I like the move at this point in the in the offseason. Um, when we saw how sort of careful and deliberate they were going, Cap, you and I have talked about this just just in our some of our conversations aside from the podcast about how, man, these guys – they're the Chicago Cubs, right? And th this this careful, risk averse way of going about their business and um, putting all their all their uh, uh, stock in the future and a, and a baseline for sustained blah blah blah. I don't think that they, I don't think that for the market they're in, the, the prices they charge, the fan base loyalty that they put enough stock in the now. And well, they finally did with this move, and I think it. I think it was with what's left on the table, the right move to make now. All right, our special guest is here. I love this guy. He was the GM of the Dodgers. He's worked with Cubs, White Sox, Blue Jays, and Mariners. He's a guru in Japan. Dan Evans, how are you, Dan? I'm doing well. Two of my favorite Chicago sports people right there, so doing really well, Cap. Back well, thank you. you for taking time. So Jed Hoyer finally let the moths fly out of the drawer, and they got the checkbook out. Shota Imanaga is coming over, left-handed starter, 30 years of age. You said to me yesterday, he's got swing and miss stuff. He's going to be a good signing. So you've seen him many times. Tell us about him. Well, first of all, Cappy, the um, the Cubs do a great job blanketing Japan and the Pacific Rim in general. Um, they're very smart about it. They're very quiet about how they scout. They send scouts over for three to four weeks and see multiple players multiple times and I think that helps them very quietly. They're one of the elite scouting teams in, in Major League Baseball. I've seen Imanaga a ton. I've probably seen him a couple dozen times in person. I saw him in college, and I saw him from his rookie year forward. Um, I like the makeup, number one. I like the competitor. I like the athleticism. But what I really like about him is he's a 30-year-old who's coming out of an environment in Yokohama where he plays to a packed house every night. He's the guy. He's the Friday night guy. He has to deliver, and he does. And, you know, expectations in a bigger market, um, for me, is always a big deal. It's, um, it's something when you're pitching at a bigger market, you, you have to go out and perform. And, you know, Chicago, New York, Boston, L.A., those markets demand performance. He'll deliver. Um, but what I like multiple things about him, guys. I like the fact that he's got a plus fastball with plus spin, plus command. He's aggressive, which a lot of pitchers in today's game are not. You know, a lot of guys are passive and a lot of guys don't attack the zone, particularly Japanese pitchers in many cases. He's not that guy. He's aggressive with his fastball, has a high spin fastball, will pitch up or down in the zone, uses all four sides of the strike zone. I think this guy's going to be a really, really good competitive 
probably three hole starter for a good team. Hey Dan, what what, what kind of uh, what kind of innings totals workload game started should we anticipate out of him? That's a great question. You know, he's that rare starter in today's game that goes deep into the ball game. He's a seven inning guy in Japan. He's giving you, he's giving you, I think, 19 out of 24 starts um, last year. He's out there in the seventh inning. And to me, that's a big deal. He doesn't relinquish the ball very easily. I've heard some great things about him through the years, all the way back to college. He's not one of those guys that hand the ball over when the manager or the pitching coach comes to the mound. He takes the ball and he also delivers a lot of pitches, throws a lot of hundred pitch outings. In fact, the overwhelming majority of his starts will be a hundred pitches or more. And in today's game, that has significant value with the bullpen. But you know, I mean, I grew up there. I grew up just a few miles from Wrigley. I know what the fans like in a guy they want a competitor. They want a guy who respects, you know, the effort and what it matters. Imanag is emotional. He's aggressive. But what he really does is he's passionate. And as a result, I think he'll be a very early fan favorite simply because he just gives you everything he's got. And there's just no passive aspect of his game. As you look at what the Cubs are doing They've been very, very quiet, and I've spoken to Jed multiple times, and Jed has said to me, look, opening day is not today, and if I get to you know, mid to late March and I haven't improved our team, you have every right to fire on me because I've got resources and I've got prospects, but we got to stop thinking, oh, the convention's on Friday, so I better have somebody at the convention. I'm not signing guys for the convention. I'm signing them to win. Yeah, and Cappy, you know what? It's a psychological finish line sometime in late December where we'd all love to have our teams done. Um, You know, I think everybody, the media, the fans, the club themselves, the players, everybody would like to be done. But in the last 15 years or so, that calendar's changed. And guys are signing all the way into early February It's a marathon. It is not a sprint. You know, I fell into that trap once in a while where you're a little anxious. I got to get something done. The key is on opening day that you feel the best club you possibly can on opening day. And I know it's frustrating for the fans, the demands on being a competitive team, um, you know, I think are really, are really true. I think the Chicago market demands a team be competitive, just like LA, New York, Boston, St. Louis. But I think this is a big step. I mean, when you look at the rotation, you look at Steele, you look at Hendricks, um, Tyon, I think they're all good pitchers, but none of them is really a number one. I think Imanaga goes right into the middle of that group. And there's going to be periods where you think he's the number one guy. I, I like this guy a lot. I like this guy as a rookie. And he had a manager in Alex Ramirez um, for the Bay Stars, who was a Venezuelan who played in the big leagues, played in North America, and instilled an aggressive attitude, but also a, a very passionate way of playing in Imanaga. And it showed immediately. So I like this guy a lot. I think this is a very good signing by the Cubs. I, I wanted to go back to the workload issue for one, one second. We were talking about, he's a seven inning guy. He's a hundred pitch guy. The thing about a hundred pitches nowadays, one of the reasons guys aren't throwing hundred pitches isn't the pitch threshold. It's the third time through the order thing. That's right. And, and that's a stuff thing. And, a, and a, do, you, do you have enough to, that a guy, can, you can still get a guy out the third time. And it sounds like what I read from about this guy is whatever his fastball level, I guess his fastball is good enough, but it's really a secondary stuff. He has a lot of secondary pitches, um, swing and miss stuff. Is that what you're talking about that gets him to that seventh inning? Is he a third time through the order guy? He is. He's got a big arsenal. Um, you know, this guy's in Japan's thrown seven pitches. I think they'll narrow that down a little bit um, in the big leagues. And it's not because the, the Japanese league is inferior. I just think he's got 
three or four quality pitches and his subordinate pitches for me are somewhat interchangeable, but I really like his fastball. His fastball is 92, 94, 95. He commands his fastball and command of a fastball is the most important thing in the game. If you can command your fastball, your secondary stuff becomes far more, um, I, I think, powerful, far more to, there to detonate and to get guys late in the count. What I really like about him, Gordon, is that he's able to pitch down or up in the zone. And with the spin rate on his fastball, which is elite, it'll be top 10% in the game. And for the viewers, you know, I'm not trying to talk over you on this one. Spin is a really important part of the game. Think of Pedro Martinez. Think of Jacob deGrom. Think of Verlander. These are all guys with high spin fastballs. They can throw up in the zone. And this guy's got Sonny Gray stuff with a Sid Fernandez arm slot. His release point is, you know, in here mm -hmm. and very athletic. But there's another thing, guys, that you're not going to get in a newspaper article. You're not going to get in a uh, in from a review from somebody who's never seen him. This guy does not yield unearned runs. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, you know, might sound esoteric, might sound to be, you know, we're playing too much inside baseball, but it's a really big deal. That air with one or two out that puts a guy on second or third in a close ball game, this guy doesn't give up unearned runs. And for me, that's one of the trademarks of a great pitcher when he's got to get the out himself. So Gordon, I think that translates to him being able to get through that third, you know, time through the order, but there's one more thing. And, you know, guys, this is, this is too many days spent in Yokohama, which has Chinatown right outside the right field um, wall. So Dan Evans likes to jump into the <laughs> Yokohama Chinatown a little bit. He played in a ballpark that's 308 down the lines. Oh, geez. 308. So when they talk about oh, fly oh, ball man. tendencies, you know, a fly ball tendency is when it's 385 to center and 308 down the lines, and you give up four bombs. I mean, no, I'm sorry, seven homers all year at home and you throw to a 169 home ERA, I'm not worried about the fly ball component. I like the fact that he can pitch up there. And guys, the Japanese strike out far less than we do. It's a cultural thing in their game. We're striking out at 24%. They're sub 20. This guy's going to punch out more guys in the big leagues than he did in Japan. And I think his arsenal the splitter is such a plus pitch. The slider slash sweeper is a good pitch. This guy's gonna this guy's gonna swing and miss a lot, and that guy succeeds in a big league scene. All right, so let me ask you this because you know how passionate Cubs fans are. You lived here. The average fan says, "Why didn't we get Otani? He was going to the Dodgers. Why didn't we get Yamamoto? Because he was going to the Dodgers." He has said, "That's where I wanted to be." Yeah. So do you push your chips in now? Gordon and I debate this all the time. The people at the Cubs have said to me, look, we got a good team, but we're still a year from Cade Horton being in our rotation. Matt Shaw potentially being our third baseman. Uh, Pete Crow Armstrong being locked in as our everyday center fielder. So what would you say to Cubs fans if they don't see the team be as aggressive as they would hope they would be? Yeah, and Cappy, you know, part of the problem is when your expectations are infinitesimal. I mean, they're, they were huge after they sound, signed Council, which I thought was a brilliant move. And not a brilliant move just for 24, but for the next five years. It gives you an elite manager that's a recruiting tool as you move forward. I think what they have is a division that's always one that's winnable, that's always competitive. Nobody in that division is going to outspend them um, to a point where they're non-competitive. I mean, think Rockies, think uh, Giants, think, you know, Diamondbacks. It's tough to be in the NL West. The NL Central doesn't give you that. 
So I think what Jed's doing. It should. It should be the Cubs doing that to everybody else. Well, I don't disagree with you, but that's not how their owner thinks. And that's not their internal way of life. But at the same time, strategically, I see them being competitive this year. I think we all forget they were competitive in 23. They just didn't have enough at the end. And I think what they've done is they've gotten thicker in their rotation. They're not done. They got more coming. There's, you know, there's no telling what else they have going on, but this is a positive step. And for Cub fans, you know, this is a guy in his prime. Just give him a little bit of time to acclimate, to get used to the ball, the city. We all know what a great place it is to live. He's got all sorts of stuff on the north side that he can walk to, that he can get to. He'll enjoy his time in Chicago. But like any of us, when you're changing jobs, there's a bit of an orientation period. The Cubs will do a good job of that. But this guy is a legit big league pitcher. And look at him as a guy who can help your team win, not be like a, you know, for me, a novelty. That's not who he is. This guy's a really good guy. So when you start breaking down how good this rotation is, and you've, you've made the case that these are all, all good pitchers, he's going to slot right in, and they were competitive last year. Yes, they were competitive. There were two games over 500, mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the playoff field kind of came Four, to four games, let's be accurate. Oh, that's right. That well, eighty-three right. and seventy-nine. Exactly. You're right. You're right. Two more losses, and they're a five hundred team. That, yes, that's what I was getting at. So, so now we know that the big losses are Bellinger and 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 uh, Stroman. If we're just talking pitching, you lose Stroman, who had a, who made the All Star team last year. He had some issues after that. Is this an upgrade over Stroman, or, or are they treading water with this move? I love Marcus. I was around Marcus in Toronto. He pitched us to the playoffs. I think this has the potential of at least being equal, if not better. Um, you know, it's it's funny, Gordon. They're both smaller starters um, mm -hmm. who have a lot of guts. Mm -hmm. They're getting by on their insides, and you know, I'm partial to that. I, I'm I'm a guy who likes guys who wear it out on the mound. You know, you don't. You don't get that. I want to be cute. I want to be pretty. I want my delivery to look good. This guy, along with Stroman, just lets it all out there. I happen personally at this point to like Imanaga a little better than Stroman. So I think it's an upgrade. But I think they still don't have that guy that if you're the other club, you go, all right, we're in trouble. Oh, shit. We're in trouble today. Exactly. We better get and, tomorrow because today we're and that's real. And, you know, for the fans, when you look at the rotation in the times of the trip and you go, oh, OK, you know, we're going to see two of their best guys in this three game. Everybody does that. And when you come in and you start a series and you're looking at who's coming in, I don't think any of those top four guys are that guy. So they're more the sum of the parts. And I think when you do that, you also set yourself up to do something at the deadline where you bring in a mercenary. And, you know, I've been there. We brought guys in that's who's basically a mercenary in late July to take those last 12 starts of the year and upgrade your rotation. But I think the current Cub rotation, when you look at St. Louis, when you look at Milwaukee, when you look at any of the teams in that division, it compares very favorably. They'll be very competitive this year. Are they, All right, better, so, than, are they better than the Cardinals? The rotation? No, I think the, now at the top. No, I like the Cardinals. I think the Cardinals were a blip. It was just a hiccup. I think the Cardinals are far too good a club. I think that's the team to beat in the NL Central this year. And I also, Gordon, you know, no one expected the Cardinals to be that bad, including the Cardinals. And there's a lot of professional pride there. I love Arenado. I absolutely love Goldschmidt. And I think they'll will themselves into contention again. And I think they've made some really strong moves in their pitching staff where one through five, there isn't a soft spot in that rotation. All right, let me ask you a question. If I told you the Cubs end up adding Reese Hoskins and Cody Bellinger with Imanaga, and then they tinker with their bullpen, they play Morrell, Master Boney, Madrigal, some combination oh, over a third. God dang. Do you like that team? You feel like that's a good offseason 
or they should do more? That's a good off season, but I think you never quite get who you want to go shopping for. You know, for me, a lot of times you go to Costco or Sam's club and you have one thing in mind. You can't get the one thing and you come home with five others in your shopping cart and you go, what the hell did I just do? Right. You know, I think this is one of those cases where they did a nice job. And I think, you know, everybody wanted Otani or at least the teams that are competitive wanted Otani. That wasn't going to happen. If the Dodgers played their game well, he was going to go to LA. And I think when you go in with expectations to get the guy and then you get subordinate guys, I think for a lot of people, they view it as disappointment. I think for me, the sum of the parts at the end of the off season is the key. And I think with what you said um, about Hoskins, Bellinger, and perhaps others, it's a good time to go shopping in January, by the way, guys, if you have payroll in January, you can do some really positive things. The teams that have already gone to their budget numbers, they can't play in that card game. So as a result, I think they're good. They're not a dominant club. They're not an elite club. But as I said earlier, I don't think you have to be elite to contend for a postseason berth with the expanded playoff situation and in their division. Yeah. I mean, it sounds sounds like you think they're going to do some more. Uh, should Should they get another starter? Should they get another depth starter? Well, they've got a number of young guys who are somewhat unproven. And as Cappy said, they've got a couple of young guys that are probably a year away. One thing I've learned in this game, those guys are never ready when you want them to be. Right. I mean, Cap, when you coached, you didn't, the freshman never played as well as nope. he did as a sophomore. Correct. And, you know, a lot of times you sit there and you see the kid in Des Moines and you go, oh my gosh, I wish he could help us right now. They're ready when they're ready. They don't match up with your Google calendar. They just don't. And, you know, the fact that that's the case, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised that they dabble in a five-hole situation. And given their rotation, thickening up the back end actually makes them much better. Um, you know, for you guys, one of the lost things in the game is that you play to get in the playoffs. And then when you get there, those four and five guys, they never get the ball. What you have to do, though, is you got to get to the dance. And those fourth and fifth starters, they're starting 40% of your games. The more you go into a game with a four or five hole guy who's better or equal to their guy, you've got a shot. So that's why for me, I'd backload. I would I would give some of those guys, those young kids, another year. And sure, they won't be happy, but we're not here to make them happy. You're here to win. And I think there's always going to be injuries. There's always going to be attrition. And if those guys are ready mid-season to be a spot starter, to be an occasional guy, hey, that's fantastic. But I think going in, the Cardinals are not going to go away easily, and the Brewers are a formidable club. And don't forget about the Reds. The Reds are going to be a really good team this year, and I don't think they're done either. So I think the division is getting more competitive. And I think one way to make yourself a better contestant is to deepen up the back end of that rotation. Yeah, the the Reds rotation might have the highest ceiling of the bunch. They also might have the lowest floor, uh, depending on health and some of these young guys. I agree, Gordon. And I think, too, you know, that division has two or three ballparks that are hitter-friendly parks. So when you don't have elite number one starters – It's more, you know, I said some of the parts earlier, it's more how good is your one through five guy? Because you've got to be able to win that occasional 10 to eight, that seven to five game where the starter is not the difference maker. So deepening up their bullpen and I think thickening up their rotation would be a solid strategic move. Hey man, last thing for you, you've got Josh Hader is still out there, but he wants a lot of money. They don't really have a defined closer. They have Alzali, but I think they would rather use him in a seventh, eighth inning role. Would you sign Josh Hader? Oh, I love Josh Hader. He's got absolutely unhittable stuff. The thing about Josh Hader is all the teams that are trying to win that don't have an established guy, 
see Josh Hader as that guy. So his number just escalates with every day we move forward. You know what he is, Cap? He's he's so unique from a stuff and arm slot and delivery perspective that the deception is even better than his stuff. I mean, nobody gets in the on deck circle and says, man, this is going to be a great at bat. Let's right. go. Not comfortable. Yeah. No, the left-handed hitters hate him. And the right-handed hitters, you know, he's he's got that nasty back foot slider that just destroys guys while he's throwing 95 to 100. So, yes, he would always be on my radar. And he'd always be on my radar because then you don't have to worry about the ninth inning. And I think if they get him, you know what council thinks about him. If they don't, you also you know might. what council thinks exactly. about Exactly. And I think there's a, there's a trick when a manager changes teams you find out what he really thinks of his former players. No, that's so a great point. So if they're all in on this guy, this guy, this guy's a dude. I just know that if you're trying to get in to the postseason and you're trying to win a game in August and September, but for that matter, in April, him on the mound for the last three outs of the game, that's pretty good situation for your ball club. Danny, thank you for your time, man. Really appreciate yeah, you thanks. greatly. Great talking to you. Great catching up. Thanks to both of you. Have a good the day. Best. You too. There he is, the great Dan Evans. Gordon, we'll see what the Cubs do. Got the convention starting on Friday. Another edition of the Cubs Recap Podcast here on YouTube and available audio only everywhere you get your favorite podcast. For Danny, for Gordon, I'm Cap. Take that.